שלום לכולם, ותודה שבאתם. שמי גילי לב, I'm a security advisor at AWS Professional Services, Security Risk and Compliance Practice. I'm based in New York City, והאמת, תהיתי אם אוכל להעביר את היום בעברית. חשבתי על זה קצת, הגעתי למסקנה שעדיף לכולנו באנגלית, ואם יש שאלות, תוכלו לשאול בכל אחת משתי השפות שכולנו מבינים. So a little bit about my background. Because up until not too long ago, I was in your seat. Before joining AWS, I arrived to a global financial services firm where, as a cloud security strategist, where multiple lines of business were pushing really hard to adopt cloud and were all declined. There was no cloud strategy, lack of knowledge, lots of fear, and zero adoption. Pioneering public cloud to a global bank wasn't an easy task and required strong leadership, clear vision and strategy to get that executive buy-in. So there are many lessons learned and also some key success factors that I'm happy to share with our customers. I want to start by telling you some real stories on what I've done from the other side. One of the first and more complex use cases that fell in my hands as I joined the global financial services firm, actually literally the first day, was also one of the more complex cases that we see. It's grid computing HPC, high performance computing. For those that may not know, grid computing is essentially a large pool of compute resources working together to solve a high performance complex problem. They maxed out internal capacity, and went to cloud. So I want to highlight a few key capabilities we would have not had if we didn't go to AWS. First, auto scaling. When grid computing is, is the jobs are working, it bursts to tens of thousands of machines at peak time. Auto scaling and having unlimited resources allocated on the go was key. Comparing to the on-prem environment that we had prior to that, the grid farm, when you build a grid farm on-prem, you have to predict, purchase the servers, kind of estimate how large it's going to get when it bursts. In the cloud, we had unlimited resources. So that was number one. Two, superpower computers. At the time, we utilized the extra large instances from AWS. There were such powerful machines that we shrunk the compute time from a few days to a few hours. That was extremely powerful. Third, increased visibility and security. So think about it. When you switch from a physical environment to an API-based one, you have a lot more visibility on everything that is happening in your environment. And if you design it correctly, control as well. So it took a while to design it, but we got more controls on what's happening rather than looking at a grid farm with a bunch of servers and cables everywhere that we didn't really know what's happening until after the fact with monitoring. So increased visibility. The fourth one, and just as important, cost saving. At the time, at that bank, the grid computing needed to run only twice a week. In AWS, you only pay for what you use. So starting the calculations, and typically it's about risk calculations and simulations. Starting the calculations, it bursts to tens of thousands of machines, runs for a few hours, finishes, discard them all down, you only pay for what you used. That was extremely important. The, on, the prior on-prem environment, all these servers were sitting idle when the grid was not running until the next run. Another use case I just want to share with you guys is, it's a public use case, you can look it up. It's called the Symfony Messaging Platform. Symfony Messaging Platform was a cross-organizational traders messaging platform. Extremely sensitive. It's what the top 15 banks in the world, such as Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan Chase, HSBC, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, and others, collaborated together to create the competing product to the Bloomberg terminal for traders. Now, 
being so sensitive in such a high visibility case, we got, I, I was honored to be the security architect on that from day one, from the financial services side, all in AWS, and we got the regulators' eyes on it pretty early in the journey. High visibility, competing with the Bloomberg terminal, we got regulators' eyes on it. Um, not only we succeeded with the um, audit and to show and prove a secure design, but they had a very interesting regulatory requirement. It's called Chinese walls. It's explicit controls who can talk to who, when, and under what conditions, since it's a cross-organizational stranger's messaging platform. And we were able to design that as well. So it's a very interesting case. It was great success. It's still on, it still is. Now, how many of you heard about the AWS Cloud Adoption Framework? That's it? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a white paper. It's available on our website to anyone. Um, the Cloud Adoption Framework helps organizations understand how cloud transforms the way they work. As we all know, it's a lot more than just a technological change, right? And we do that by focusing on six key areas, what we call the six perspectives. As you can see on the left side, it's the business perspectives. Business, people, and governance. For business, for example, what are your business objectives and how do you align IT to it? For people perspectives, do you have the right people skills in your organization today to support cloud? Are you gonna hire more? Are you gonna train your people? On the right side, we have the technical perspectives, platform security and operations. For security, for example, how do you ensure that your cloud architecture is aligned with your security requirements and control objectives? Now, while security requirements stay the same, the mechanisms to get to them change. For example, in the old traditional network, we used to protect the perimeter with a bunch of nice firewalls. But today, in the cloud, we switch to host-based firewalls called security groups. So it's done differently. Now, if you haven't heard of this, how many heard about the CAF security perspective? Anyone heard about the AWS CAF security perspective? Okay. That one is an, <laughs> we got one. It's an independent white paper. That one is, it's available to anyone. I highly recommend downloading and reading it. The AWS Cloud um, CAF Security Perspective gives organizations a structured approach to make one, good risk-based decisions, two, build their security guardrails, and three, meet their compliance goals as they migrate to AWS. And we focus on four pillars, and that will be the base for my talk today. The first is the directive. The directive component is all about the governance, risk, and compliance of the environment you'll operate within. The preventative, how are you gonna protect your workloads from, mitigate and vulnerability, uh, from threats and vulnerabilities? The detective is all about visibility and transparency into your environment. And lastly, the responsive is all about incident response. How do you ensure you can mitigate any deviation from your baseline? And this will be the base for the talk today. So <clears throat> I want to share something with you, something we learned from hundreds of engagements with large enterprise customers. We helped so many customers migrate to AWS, and we started seeing a pattern in their overall cloud journey. And that's what we call the stages of adoption. The first stage is the discovery stage. That's what we see customers exploring the art of possible, getting familiar with cloud, maybe doing some cost analysis, running some POCs. The second stage, the project stage, is where we actually see pro production projects popping up in the enterprise, typically to cover a specific need. A great example and most common in financial services is grid computing, actually. It has a very high demand because of the agility time to market and, and auto scaling and other benefits. The next stage is the foundation stage. That's where customers already see the benefit of cloud for their business and start making a foundational investment to get ready for scale. 
Typically, at this stage, we see a cloud center of excellence being formed, which is essentially a cloud-dedicated team. But not someone's second or third job, a fully 100% cloud-dedicated team at that stage. Migration stage is where we see customers already migrating mission-critical applications, large portfolios, or even entire data centers. I'm sure many of you heard some of our customers standing on stage at reInvent stating they're going to close X amount of data centers by the following year. And lastly, reInvention is all about optimization. Once you're in the cloud, you optimize your technical and business processes. Another view quickly on the stages of adoption, I want to highlight the innovation line, the green line. We see organizations are looking to develop brand new business capabilities to take advantage of cloud native features. The type of technology that will be very hard to replicate on-prem, such as auto-scaling and serverless architecture. At the same time, the blue line, they would like to retire technical debt, and all along, progress with the cloud adoption framework. I want to highlight the importance of having a governance pro um, program in your enterprise. Once you start the migration, it takes, it gets a momentum. So the business sees how the agility, the time to market, how fast and easy and convenient it is, and can give them a business edge. The momentum starts popping up, and having a governance program early on is key to have some level of control and visibility into the adoption and what's happening in your enterprise. So I'm just going to go back quickly to my example from the financial services firm just prior to joining AWS. There was nothing prior to me joining. There was no cloud, so no governance program for that. What we did is started a cloud governance committee. We took stakeholders from each business unit, whether it's wealth management, investment banking, IT services, even from risk, security, legal, put them all together in a committee that would meet once a month and review the cloud cases to approve them final to production. The key was, instead of that being a hub, a, a stopper, creating a bottleneck, it actually accelerated the pipeline. And the reason for it is, is the prerequisites we placed for it. And this is rooted in each and every organization you're coming from. So for us at the time, even before cloud, if we wanted to roll out a new application or a new software, right? So you had to do first pass a security architecture review, show us an approval that you passed that. Second, go through a risk assessment, and then with mitigating controls, the residual risk after that. Three, bring a approval from legal and compliance, depending on the region, which country in the world, because it's all global companies. And four, if it's sensitive data, go through penetration testing and remediation program. Let's say these were the four requirements for us for anything new. We took that and applied it as a prerequisite to come to that committee. So if you have a new cloud initiative, you'd like to open new things and build new things, you have to go through that. It could be that a security review may take, security architecture review may take a few months or even or a few days. But when you come to the committee, you already have the approval, so you're after the fact. That gave us also a central hub of visibility. What cases, what demand, what's going to the cloud, what's not. The second one is data classification. It's really important to pay attention to data classification levels and um, drive control objectives and the security baseline according to that. Um, in financial services, typically it's public data, internal only, confidential, and secret. Each have their own level of security requirements. But we realized that uh, roughly 70, 80% of data falls under confidential. If you think about it, not all data is as sensitive, though, within the same data classification level. So PII, meaning personally identifiable information, whether it's your ID number in the United States, a social security number, or date of birth, or address, is not as sensitive as some other application data that is considered confidential, but it's not personal to someone. So what I did back then is suggested a subclassification to confidential, we called it risk level one and risk level two. What it did, and that's a point why I'm telling you this, is started where we can start making the efforts to move to the cloud by classifying. So for personally identifiable information, until you figure out if you have in some countries to tokenize or encrypt the data, 
until you figure out your strategy on protecting the data, start where you can with risk level two, everything that fall, fell under that bucket. Companies' policies, if you're in a regulated industry, public sector, government, uh, healthcare, life sciences, or financial services, everything is rooted in those companies' policies. However, those companies' policies were built years ago, way before cloud. So sometimes it needs reviewing it and cloudifying them. Even the language which they were built in is only talking about the on-prem environment. So it doesn't mean that it's not allowed to do something, it's just it wasn't built in with cloud in mind. Going back to those, reviewing them, potentially tweaking them is also key. And last, security standards and controls. Um, having a solid set of security standards. When I got to that bank, they had a really great uh, detailed set of security standards, also built a few years prior. So no cloud in it, we had to review it and make sure that it can be adjusted to what cloud can give you. Same security bar or even higher in the cloud, but phrased differently. Lastly and most important, all of the above in a cloud security strategy. And this is for executive leadership typically, top-down approach for an organization to move to the cloud, having clarity on your vision, how you plan to get there, what would be your governance model, and communicating it to everyone. Quick story on a, a, one of the customers, uh, there's a pretty interesting talk from reInvent. They went on stage and they told the story of the bucketing system. So this specific customer had a few thousand applications in their portfolio to move to the cloud. They had the executives say, it's a go. We want to move to the cloud. Wasn't an issue. Let's start. Where do we start? So they did a portfolio assessment on all everything they have, but the classification was key. So if it's a microservices architecture, API-based and fault tolerance, let's say we call it native. It may not be in the cloud today, maybe on-prem, but there's no reason it can be in the cloud from an architectural standpoint. Eligible. It could be on a VM today, and once they did the portfolio assessment, they discovered that it's not limited by any licensing um, structure. So also, it may not be in the cloud today, but there's no reason it can be in the cloud. While others that may need to be refactored or re-architected, you can start with those later on. So their story was we were able to come back to our executive leadership and board within two weeks with classification of our entire environment and where we can start our efforts. That was very powerful. They started, they're very successful in their journey today. Okay. <laughs> How many of you are well familiar with the AWS shared responsibility model? Okay, we got a little bit more than the cloud um, adoption framework. Um, I'm gonna recap for those that may not be familiar. The AW this is key to understand anything you're doing with AWS. The AWS Share responsibility model gives a detailed understanding where AWS responsibility ends and where the customer responsibility begins. However, depending on the service used, that watermark line between AWS to the customer may change, and that's the key to understand. It's not a static one. So for example, for infrastructure services, right, such as EC2 or EBS, AWS is responsible to secure, maintain, and operate everything from the physical infrastructure, the facilities, up to the hypervisor layer. And it's the customer responsibility to secure everything on top. But if you move up to container services, such as Amazon Redshift, Amazon RDS, or um, CloudFront, you see we, uh, AWS is also responsible for the operating system, network configuration, an application platform. And that line can move further up the more the managed service it is. For example, for S3, Glacier, DynamoDB, we manage more. So it's really important to understand where that line is drawn. The AWS Security Epics program is something that we created at Professional Services, Security Risk and Compliance, it's my group, and essentially, we identified 10 themes that we treat as epics in an agile methodology. First, we focus on the core five, identity and access management, logging and monitoring, infrastructure security, 
data protection and incident response. And then once they get to a maturity level, we layer in the augmenting five, resilience, compliance validation, secure CICD pipeline, DevSecOps, configuration and vulnerability analysis, and then security through big data. Now the way we deliver it is multiple delivery teams starting to kick off the first epic, and, and it's, in, it's delivered in two week sprints. I'll give you an example in a moment. Once the first epic is, is kicked off, a couple of weeks later we kick off the second one, then they work in parallel up to maturity level. And we found out of hundreds of security engagements with customers that it brings the customers to a very, uh, it brings them really good results as far as maturity in their security posture. So an example for a sprint for identity and access management would be, okay, so let's create the account, give it some access controls. That would be the first, the first sprint, the first two weeks. The second sprint would be, now let's implement federation. And then the third one would be, now we can expand to multiple accounts to cater to the organization and build a multi-account strategy. Just as an example, the first three sprints. I want to focus on the core five, and there's a specific order we deliver the core five, um, and that order matters a lot. So comparing to prior to cloud, traditional environment, what would you do? You would purchase a server, right? Install an operating system on it, create accounts, and give them permissions. In the cloud, it's vice versa. The first thing you do is create an account. Hence, identity and access management is the first core security epic. The second epic, detective controls, logging and monitoring, so you can see what's created in your environment, anything that will be happening. You, ha you need to have visibility. Then infrastructure security is where you build your VPC, your security groups, your subnets, your NACLs, hardening your AMIs. And once you secure your environment, you're ready to put your data in it, so data protection is the fourth core epic. How are you going to protect your data? What encryption strategy are you going to use? You're going to use a hybrid between encryption and tokenization, and so on. And lastly, and really important to be part of the core five, is incident response. So you can ensure you can mitigate any deviation from your baseline. Anything that happens, any incident, will be automatically remediated. Now I'm talking about automation and incident response, and that's something that customers need some time to get to, because today they may have a really nicely documented incident response uh, um, process, but it typically is kicked off manually. Someone is getting an alert, something is going on, they're gonna look at the logs, then they're gonna kick off the incident response team, um, process. But when you think of, about scale, as your environment grows, and you may have, incidents can happen maliciously or unintentionally, in multiple locations, it takes time for human to, to treat it. Anyone heard about Chaos Monkey? <laughs> oh, we got one. Um, one of our customers that I'm sure you all are very familiar with, Netflix, took incident response to the next level. They created a piece of software called Chaos Monkey running in the production since 2011 literally shooting in all directions, corrupting, shutting down instances, and disrupting in order to prove at all times that nothing is actually disrupted, meaning full recovery automatically, full high availability and fault tolerance. So if it falls here, everything continues just as usual to the other location. And think about what it does to their developers. When someone is building something at Netflix, they already know that Chaos Monkey is running in production, they're gonna have to build from day one with fault tolerance and high availability in mind. So it, did, it made a lot of changes there and got them to, to be very successful with incident response. Um, but they took it to a whole other level. Uh, let's, let's start with some automation first. Now, I wanna highlight a few of the key uh, services and capabilities to help you understand what do we do and what do we offer for each of the core epics. For identity and access management, first we have AWS organizations. This is basically a policy uh, managed, um, kind of like policy managed service for multiple accounts. And I'm not talking two, three AWS accounts. We have customers that run hundreds of accounts and that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. They can apply, centrally apply policies to accounts, to group of accounts and manage it. 
Within an account, we have the AWS Identity and Access Management, and that is the fine granular control, access controls, who can do what, under what conditions, with what permissions. Um, some of the key best practices for IAM is having MFA, multi-factor authentication. So any user connecting to your APIs or the console should have multi-factor authentication. The root account, not only MFA, but also the second factor should be vaulted, meaning completely untouched. And once you create your environment, recommended not to use the root account. Should be just vaulted and have a break glass procedure to get to it if needed. Um, the third one is federation. Whatever your identity store is today, whether it's Active Directory or anything else, where you do your provisioning and your permissions to users, federated to AWS. Lastly is Amazon Cognito. This is for mobile, mobile and web applications, also access control. We have integration with social IDPs uh, via SAML2. The next one is detective controls. We have plenty of services and capabilities for logging and monitoring. I'm just gonna highlight a few. The first one is CloudTrail. If you're not using CloudTrail today, you should. This is what records every single API call in your environment, who made the call to which service and when. So you have full visibility. Um, AWS Config is a very strong change management tool. So it gives you a detailed inventory of everything, all the resources you have in AWS today, their current configuration, and re continuously records any changes to the configuration. So if you made a change, and it's not a desired change in your environment, you're gonna be alerted and know about it. Now you can also go back in time, you can snap six months ago, what was my entire configuration of my whole environment, my whole data center, and you'll be able to see it and compare the two. It's very powerful. Um, Amazon CloudWatch is log aggregation, you can sort alerting and, and events, um, integrated with Splunk or Alert Logic or whatever you're using for logging. And then fairly new, some of you may have heard about it, is Amazon Guard Duty. That's essentially a managed threat detection service that is based on machine learning, anomaly detection, and integrated threat intelligence. So this is where the attack vectors are being identified with a lot more than just you know, the, the traditional way. When we use machine learning, there's a smarter way to identify them and predict them. The next one is uh, just VPC flow logs. That's where you can get just logs of your uh, VPC traffic. Um, allowed, denied traffic, ports, uh, packets, and so on. For infrastructure security, um, security groups. These are our stateful host-based firewalls that allow, explicitly allow traffic, inbound traffic to your hosts. By default, it's deny all. The next one is cloud formation and cloud formation templates. How many are familiar with cloud formation or have worked with it? All right, we got a few. This is um, a service that can allow you to manage and kind of like create and manage your entire infrastructure in a predictable way. This is what we call infrastructure as code. So the power of this is, this is essentially a JSON template, it's a piece of code that details everything that you're gonna have in your environment. So before you roll it up out, you can test it, you can risk assess it, right? Um, you can review it, peer review it, and decide what is the state up to the very little details you would like to have in your infrastructure, and then roll it out. Once you build your data center, tweaked it, worked with it for a while, it got to a good state. Now you wanna have presence in another region. You just take that cloud formation template and replicate the entire environment. So everything is up to code, controlled with code. It's not like the prior to cloud, you build the environment and then you start kind of like optimizing. Here you predicted in a piece of code prior to that. Um, the reusability also of cloud formation templates is the, is the powerful part here. Once the executive, um, let's say, uh, management team would like to have some controls on what developers can do, what operations can do, and other teams, they build a certain environment, they approve it for them with certain limitations, and then allow them to use those cloud formation templates to, um, to kick off the environment. Amazon VPC is essentially your isolated network segment, your own IP range, subnets, uh, routing tables. 
And then shield is our DDoS attack, denial of service attack protection. We have two layers to that. Um, the first one is free and built in. It's for common DDoS attacks. And then you have the shield advanced paid service, but you can have the option to customize rules to protect yourself in whichever industry you're in or whatever applications you have. It could be that there's different attack vector for each. And lastly, web application firewall also. You can define rules um, to uh, protect your applications. Fourth epic, one before the five, um, certificate manager helps you create, deploy, uh, renew, and um, um, rotate applications, uh, sorry, <laughs> certificate in your environment. It's easier uh, rather than you have to watch when certificates expire and all that, so it, it does certificate management. For encryption, you need to decide what's your encryption strategy. And there are two kind of high level options. It's either you utilize Cloud HSM, which is a hardware security module, which you can get from AWS, a Cloud HSM in your VPC, but then the key management and plugging into some of the services is your responsibility, or the AWS KMS, key management service, that we do the key management for you. Now even with KMS, you have two options. One is bring your own key, meaning you generate the encryption key on-prem and you import it into KMS, or you can generate it by KMS. With KMS, we use um, an envelope encryption, which is essentially a key encrypting, key encrypting key, hierarchy of key encryption. A new service I want to tell you about is Amazon Macy. So anyone is concerned about GDPR coming into effect on May 25th? Okay, we have a few. GDPR is a new regulation from um, the EU for gen general data protection regulation. It has quite a lot in it to learn, but everyone that has any data um, belong that belongs to people from the EU or based in the EU um, should be well aware of it and get prepared. We came out with Macy since this is a machine learning and artificial, artificial intelligence service that crawls on all of your data, discovers personally identifiable information, classifies it, and notifies you if it's not protected. So the discovery and classification is key. We, we spoke to a lot of customers that thought they knew where all their sensitive data is. While they thought they knew and they knew a bulk of it, there were other locations in their um, environment they didn't know there was sensitive data at. So Macy can help you identify all the locations because it crawls on everything on where you have sensitive data and especially personal data. Last one is incident response. Trusted Advisor is a, a really cool tool that gives you a dashboard in real time of your environment. It can help you actually improve um, some of like, uh, let's say performance or reduce cost. Like it can notify you, hey, I noticed that 10 of your machines have been idle for over 24 hours. You might want to shut them down because when you shut them down, you don't pay for it. Um, Improved security can notify you, let's say there's a S3 bucket that wasn't encrypted. While this shouldn't be happening, but that's just an example, you might want to encrypt it. And then lastly, we have config rules. We spoke about AWS config. That's what gives you the current configuration and any changes to the configuration. Config rules allow you to define the state you would like to be in as far as the configuration of your environment. And if you couple it with Lambda, a Lambda function, which is our serverless compute that just runs code for you, you can actually, if someone is making change in your environment that becomes non-compliant, it can snap it back to a compliant state. So you enforce some changes not to be made if it takes you out of compliance. So this is where you define the rules, and along with the Lambda function, you can have an automated reaction. Before we wrap up, um, I think, I'm assuming that most of you have seen this slide one way or another. It's no news that AWS has a very fast pace of innovation and a growing one too. Um, I'll recap for those that may not be familiar. In 2011, we released 82 services and features, up to 280 in 2013, 722 in 2015, up 40% to 
1,017 in 2016, and up 40% again to 1,430 last year. So we, we have a growth of 40% year over year. And the reason I'm putting it up here is we constantly get the question, how do you do that? This is a really fast pace of innovation. So it's rooted in three key factors. First, we work in small, agile, what we call two pizza team <laughs> structure. We literally call it two pizza team. It's the size of a, of a team that can be fed with two pizzas. Literally, that's how they call it. So the key is to have operations, engineering, and security working together. Small, agile, and all three. So no more segregation between development and operations, and then security comes later in the end. All together integrated from the get-go. The second one, we promote a culture of ownership along all levels of the organization. So those teams, even if they're the developers, can communicate directly with our customers. 95% of our roadmap is based on customer feedback. That's pretty large. So those teams have, they're autonomous teams, they have ownership A to Z on what they're creating. And when you build a culture of ownership and security in mind, it helps with the, with the way they build things from the get-go. The third one, we adhere to the MVP model. It's called minimum viable product. Not sure if some of you are familiar, but it's the same as the an analogy between a skateboard to a car. So if a customer asks you, I would like to get from A to B, right? The need is to get from A to B. You could say, well, I'll give you a skateboard in a week. Let's see what else you need, and we're going to iterate and improve it. But you're going to get something. It's gonna, it may answer your need completely. Or you're going to need more things, we're going to iterate. Or you can say in the old way, wait a year, and I'll give you a car. The car will get them from A to B, but many, many features in the car, when it's going to take a year, may not be relevant to what they needed. And this is the key here. We constantly promote, release one thing that you do really well, get feedback, iterate, and repeat. And that's how we innovate so fast. So getting to cloud is a journey. And every journey, every organization will be unique. But if you remember the cloud adoption framework, the six perspectives, not only just the technology, but paying attention to the people, the culture, the business needs, putting them all together. And the CAF security perspective, the four pillars, starting with directive, having governance as well, and the protective um, controls. We've seen many customers succeed when they put these all together. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. For GDPR, yes. The question was if I can talk about what Amazon is doing for GDPR, the, the general data protection regulation from the EU. So first of all, all of our services, as we stated from AWS, will be GDPR compliant by May 25th when it's coming into effect. In addition, we have some, some of our experts working with the customers to help them. Basically, it's a lot of uh, legal work, as some of you may know. It's working with your own lawyers, interpreting the, how the GDPR is applying to your business and how to approach it, how to treat it. But essentially, what I would say is a proper data protection with all the key guardrails that I mentioned today will get you to a very good mature state as far as GDPR. Um, as far as procedures and processes, that's every business and every industry. So we can consult about it, yeah. We can help. Anything else? Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>